So my name is Eric Johnson. I have a privilege of serving in a lot of different ministries, some in the church and some outside of the church. So wisdom for me is about learning how to walk with God over the many years of my life and how to listen a lot more and speak a lot less. Um, God put in my heart uh, almost two years ago a real clear vision about building tiny homes for our homeless community. It frankly has been received early on on deaf ears, um, but God kept pressing on by bringing people together and bringing people to the table at just the right time. And so in the last three months, for example, uh, God has opened the door for a partnership with Soledad Prison. We're gonna create a tiny home village for post prisoners and they're gonna live in that village. They're gonna manufacture homes. They're gonna have skills that they learned in prison, how to build these things. They're gonna be loved by our community and our churches. And they're gonna be ready to be integrated back into the community. People that we meet and encounter every day in life wanna share their story. They want to tell about who they are and the struggles they have. And, and if I could just be there to, to listen and to uh, not only sound back words of wisdom from God that I'm hearing from His Spirit as I'm, as I'm with that person, but use His Word to speak into people's lives, uh, then that's the most effective tool I've found of, of receiving God's wisdom and imparting it to others. So wisdom is putting into action God's Word that changes us to be more like Jesus. Nitroglycerin, invented in 1847. It's primarily used in explosives manufacturing. It's also used in construction, demolition, and also mining industries. It's colorless, it's odorless, it's highly dangerous. In fact, it's, uh, it's actually claimed thousands of lives when carelessly, recklessly, or intentionally mishandled or misused. And you know, just a couple of small drops of this packs a pretty powerful punch, as you can see in this video. You know, it's kind of funny because last week, you know, Pastor Nate, during his sermon, he had me in the back catching footballs as he was throwing them. So I thought it would be only fair this week, right, if Pastor Nate perhaps caught my ball of nitroglycerin. <laughs> Notice Pastor Nate's not here this morning. So, well, don't worry. This is actually just a replica. At least that's what the tech team told me. Uh, so we're talking about something as equal, equally volatile and dangerous as nitroglycerin this morning. We're actually talking about the words that we communicate. And because of the powerful effect that our words can have, especially in this technology and information-driven world that we live in, here at Shoreline, we're actually dedicating several messages throughout the summer as we journey through the book of James to actually look at this topic of words and communication. And if you remember earlier this summer during our Real Faith series, Pastor Kevin shared a message about the dangers of gossip and grumbling. And then last week, Pastor Nate, he actually encouraged us as part of our current series, Faith in Action, to actually put our faith in action by being quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to anger. And this week, uh, we'll be continuing, diving back into the book of James, and then this, this series of faith in action, we'll be looking at what it means to speak with the wisdom of heaven. And as is important is to address in Shoreline, our church here today, it was equally as important back in the early church. In fact, James, he actually dedicated nearly an entire chapter just to address this idea of the importance of words and communication. So if you would, turn with me to James chapter 3, and we'll be actually looking at verses 2 through 10. Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. And likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, 
a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for the power of your word, the truth of your word that reminds us of the power of the words that we speak and we communicate. And so, Lord, this morning we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place and it would fill our hearts and it would convict us where needed and where and when needed, Lord. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you. And now, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to speak through us during this time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you ask me to summarize the book of James, and in particular this one chapter, I would basically say something like, there seems to be a whole lot of talking going on and not a lot of doing going on in the body of believers. And the talking that is going on is clearly not the kind of talking that should be going on. And see, I think as applicable as James' words were and his words of caution were back then, I think they're probably as applicable to us today. In fact, I would argue that maybe they're even more important even to us today because now more than ever, James' words on the importance of our words carry even greater significance. When you consider all of the web-based technology that we have, when you consider things like social media, first-person videos, and these little things right here called smartphones. It's amazing because no longer are words only spoken. Words can be communicated by emailing, by texting, and also by Snapchatting. Not that I've ever done that before, but these things right here, they can sure get us in trouble, can't they? Anybody here ever accidentally pocket dialed someone and you didn't realize it? Or how about that accidental text that you sent to somebody and then you realized you sent something private or personal to the wrong person? All right, yeah, there's a lot of no heads going, nodding, yep. Okay, so I'm not the only one that's done that. That's good to know. So what can we learn from these verses in James? And how can we apply them to our life? Well, I think we see that there are really three distinct realities and a couple of stark implications. Reality number one. The tongue and the words that we communicate display a really unmatched power. In verse 2 through 6, James likens the tongue to some small but powerful items. I'm talking about the horse. When you think about a horse, it's unmatched strength, unmatched stamina, unmatched speed, yet just a small bit that's made out of metal, leather, or even bone can change the direction of that powerful horse with just the slightest flick of the wrist or the slightest pull on the reins. Control the head, control the horse. And James talks about a ship, these massive ships. You think about a ship, it's unmatched power to cross the deepest oceans and even to cover the greatest distance and carry the most precious of cargo. And yet, just a small rudder can actually alter its course and its direction. Control the rudder, control the ship. Oh, consider mankind. Unmatched power to communicate and to speak, yet just something as small as this little tongue. It can both control and direct our lives. Can it not? Control the tongue, control yourself. Reality number two, the tongue and the words we communicate possess unlimited potential. And we see this in verses 5 through 10. James describes the potential pitfalls and the dangers of the words that we communicate. In verse 5, he likens our tongue 
to a raging forest fire that starts with just one small spark and it quickly spreads and consumes and destroys everything in its path. And I think this image is particularly impactful. And as Pastor Keith prayed earlier, you know, as what we see what's going on, and many of us, maybe even in this room here, we know people or even there are people here who are personally affected by that fire. And we don't know what caused the fire. And at some point, I know investigators will find that out. But I suspect what may have happened was just one small spark started that fire. And now it has spread and continues to spread with devastating consequences. You know, and I think about that, and I think, just like that one small spark, just one word, just one text, just one tweet can also have the same potential to spread and cause devastation and damage damage and devastation to real people and real relationships. And also in verse 6, we see that James points out that the tongue in our word has the potential to be easily influenced and corrupted by the powers of hell. I mean, that is very sobering, isn't it? To know that the words we communicate, they have the potential to actually be used as weapons of evil. And finally, in verses 8 through 10, we see that the tongue and our words have the potential to be both deadly and double-minded, filled with poison and hypocrisy. In one breath, we're praising God. In that same breath, we're cursing people. And we've all probably felt the sting, haven't we, of someone's words. I mean, maybe it was words, they were words that were spoken behind our back by someone who called us your friend. And maybe it was also a text message or an email that somebody sent and you received it and you weren't supposed to. And maybe that person was a trusted confidant or a trusted friend. Or maybe it was words that someone shared with you, someone that you loved dearly and someone you respected deeply. And they shared words with you that cut deeply. And those words brought death to a relationship. And maybe, just maybe, we were the ones that used those words. I think we can all agree that James, as James says in verse 10, he says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. You see, words have the power and potential to affect our lives and the lives of those we interact with, don't they? And are you ready for some more sobering news? Reality number three, the tongue and the words we communicate present unique problems. Back to James 3, verses 7 and 8. James says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures. He covers all of those areas in the animal kingdom. And he says, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Here's the first problem. No one can tame the tongue. It's an area that we all struggle with. I can't do it. You can't do it. Nothing we do can tame the tongue. And as much as our mothers tried, not even washing it out with soap can tame the tongue, right? I'm really surprised. I mean, that's the only reason why Zest Bar Soap, I think, made it all those years, right? Well... I would say even though, and this is the the really good news, though, even though it's impossible for us to tame the tongue, Jesus reminds us that God can do what is impossible for us. Mark 10, 27, and Jesus is talking with his disciples, and it says that Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Say that with me. All things are possible with God. The only solution to the impossibility of our taming the tongue is a supernatural solution. We need God's power and his presence to do it. And here's the other dilemma that we face when we consider what it's like and how we can tame the tongue. You see, the tongue is not really the real source of the words that we're communicating. In James 3, verses 11 and 12, continuing in chapter 3, It says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? 
My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Well, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Well, what's James saying here? You see, like each of these three examples, the words we use, they cannot be concealed and they can't be inconsistent with their source. You see, our words, they merely reflect their source. Bitter and angry words come from a bitter and angry source. And what's the source? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. In Luke 6.45, Jesus again is now speaking to his disciples, and Jesus says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You see, the heart is actually the root, and the words we speak are simply the fruit. Let me say that again. The heart is actually the root, and the words we speak are simply the fruit. So in order to address the fruit problem, we first have to address the root problem. And that root problem is sin. The evil that Jesus is talking about in Luke 6.45, he's talking about it's sin. And because God knows the depth of sin's roots in us, God demonstrated the depth of his love for us by providing a solution. And the only solution to that, to our heart word problem, the only solution is Jesus Christ. You see, he's the only one who can take away the sin that's in our hearts. He's the only one that can fill us with God's love. And see, when we surrender our heart to him and when we place our faith in him and we commit our life to follow him, he takes the sin from our heart. I mean, that's good news. No, that's great news, isn't it? That's great news. And today, let me just, let me just ask this. If, if you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ and you have any questions about that, after service, Pastor Keith and I will be up front here and we would love to talk with you if you have any questions. So please come forward. We'd love to speak with you. And see, as we follow Jesus, he transforms us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we are transformed by, by his love and grace, we should be actively and humbly seeking to grow to be more like him. We're, not always, we're, we're, we're definitely not perfect, right? But we're actively seeking and humbly trying to, to grow to be more like him. We're putting our faith and action. Here's the implication. Taming the tongue, and our thumbs for that matter, it begins with a surrendered, transformed, and humble heart that's growing more like Jesus. And as we grow more like Jesus, God's Holy Spirit empowers us and equips us to move from speaking words of death and destruction like we hear in James to words of life and healing. And see, nitroglycerin, we talked about it. Small, volatile, and extremely dangerous when used recklessly and carelessly, huh? Like our words. But interesting, nitroglycerin, in a different form, it actually can protect and preserve life. You see, Nitroglycerin is actually a very powerful vasodilator. Simply, it's a medicine that actually opens up the blood vessels and allows the blood to flow to and from our hearts. And in July 2002, I was experiencing a near-complete blockage of the main artery in my heart. And I had to be medically evacuated from West Point, New York, to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Silver Spring, Maryland, a journey that took six hours in the back of an ambulance. And at some point in that journey, a really smart EMT, he gave me one single small pill of nitroglycerin. And by God's grace and his hand of protection and the actions of a smart EMT who used nitroglycerin wisely, I'm standing here today. Praise God for him. You see, I think in a similar manner, you know, when we're transformed by the power of Jesus, our words, our words, when used wisely, 
They can bring life. They can bring hope. And they can bring healing. Can they not? And we get to put our faith in action, and we get to partner with Jesus to do this. It's not just to be his hands and feet. And that's absolutely important, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. But we can also be his voice. And we can be his voice, and we can speak life and hope, and we can speak grace, and we can speak forgiveness, and we can speak truth. Words that reflect his love and his forgiveness and the wisdom of heaven. And that's what I want to be. Someone who reflects the love of Jesus and who communicates words of heavenly wisdom. And I pray that that's what each and every one of you wants to be as well. Or what if we had a framework that we could use that would actually help us partner with Jesus to do this in our own lives? Well, there's some more good news. We do. The timeless truth of God's word and, and what we find here in the book of James, it actually gives us a framework where we can actually put our faith in action and actually tame the tongue and the thumbs. And I want you to remember just three words. Search, seek, and speak. Can you say that with me? Search, seek, and speak. See, faith in action says if I want to advise a friend, maybe they have a major life decision that's coming up, I want to be able to take the time to search and seek and speak. And maybe it's a time when maybe you and your spouse have a disagreement. That's a time to search, seek, and speak. And how about if somebody posts something on your Facebook page that's not very kind and certainly kind of hurtful, right? That's a time to search, seek, and speak. So let's look at that the framework that James lays out for us. First, we're going to search our heart. James 3, verses 13 and 14. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. You see, before I speak or communicate to others, I need to ask, is there anything that I may have in my heart, anything that may have crept into my heart that might be a hindrance or might be offensive? And as James says, is there any attitude of pride, envy, bitterness? Are there any selfish or hidden motives? And how do I do that? All I need to do is ask God to show me that. And I can pray to ask him to reveal that and when he reveals those things, and if there are some of those harmful motives or those harmful hidden attitudes, we need to confess. And we need to ask God to remove them first. It's simply, Lord, empty me and fill me with your wisdom. And just as the tongue and our heart are connected, so our words and wisdom are also connected. And when we want to speak into the lives of others, or maybe it's just to respond to others, we should do so with wisdom. And it's not our own wisdom, and it's certainly not the wisdom of the world. We want to speak with God's wisdom. Amen? Because God's wisdom, it doesn't change, and it's always true. And if we truly care about those we're communicating with, which should be everyone... And we want to make sure that we communicate and we speak with heavenly wisdom. And if we want to speak with heavenly wisdom, then we need to seek heavenly wisdom. That's our next step. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You see, we just need to ask God for him to fill us with his wisdom. And we can do this as we pray through prayer. We can also do this by, by studying and reflecting and meditating on the truth of his word. And maybe it's seeking wise counsel from other believers. I look back on my own life, you know, and I realize the times when I've gotten into the most trouble with my words are times when I haven't taken the time to seek godly wisdom. And what's amazing is when I have a particular issue that maybe it's real heated or it's actually very emotional, 
those are the times that I need to really, really, really spend extra time seeking his wisdom. And here's what's also interesting about that. The times that I did take to seek his wisdom, the words that I spoke to the other person, they seem to be received a whole lot better. The power of God's Holy Spirit. And so then when we finally do speak or communicate, we need to speak with wise words. And in order to speak with wise words, then our words should reflect the wisdom of heaven. And James gives us a great description of what that looks like. James 3, verse 17, says that, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. You see, heavenly wisdom yields first words that are pure. And words that are pure are words that are absent of any sinful attitude or motive. Our words then should reflect that first and foremost. Heavenly wisdom also yields words that are peace-loving. And let me just say this. Our world and our nation could really use more people speaking with words that are peace-loving. Could we not? Amen. Amen. I mean, between all the mudslinging that goes on in the media and the dogpiling that goes on in social media, I mean, it has gotten out of control. I mean, dogpiling, think of the term. How many of you have actually ever been dogpiled before? Anyone? I mean, where did that come? Where does that come from? Who thought of that? I mean, it's worse than dodgeball. Some poor, some poor kid is out on the playground, and the next thing you know, he trips and falls, he or she, and they fall, and everybody yells, dogpile. And one by one, kids are climbing on top and just crushing that little boy, that little girl, into the ground. And the funny thing is, everybody loves to be the ones jumping on top, don't they? But how many of you have been the one on the bottom? I've been that person. I remember being crushed into the asphalt and just feeling this weight, just overwhelming weight on top of me, pressing me down, suffocating me, until finally someone reached in and pulled me out. You know, when we go on social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or you name it, and we comment on maybe a tragedy that's happened in someone's life, and we feel that we need to comment on that. We don't even know the person. We're essentially doing that. We're dogpiling. Wow. Words are peace-loving. Instead of piling on, peace-loving words actually are those words that help restore and pick people up when they've been knocked down. It's those words that say, let me give you a hand. Let me pull you out of the pile. I mean, that's what peace-loving words are. And also, peace-loving words are words that promote unity. They build bridges, and they break down barriers. Words like, how can I help? Words like, can I pray for you? I mean, I can't tell you guys how many times in my life when I've really been struggling with something, and somebody actually says those words, can I pray for you? And right then and there, they pray for me. You know, there's a peace, the peace that just comes into our life when it happens. Words are peace-loving. They promote unity, they build bridges, and they break down barriers. And words that are peace-loving also bring healing. Words like, I am sorry. Words like, please forgive me. Now, why are those words so hard for us to say? I don't know if you struggle with that, but I do. And you know why? I think it goes back to what James talks about earlier. I think it's just a matter of sinful pride that creeps into my life, into my heart and gets in the way of me acknowledging, first of all, my responsibility. Maybe it's a time when I've used unwise words. Well, I need to acknowledge that, and then I need to ask for forgiveness. Words that are peace-loving. Heavenly wisdom also yields words that are considerate. And it's interesting because James uses, when he uses the word considerate, he's actually describing the same word that's used throughout the Old Testament when they describe God's disposition as the kind and gentle king. God as the kind and gentle king. And then we as his children then are to be marked by this quality. We're supposed to be kind and gentle, especially in the way that we speak. I mean, don't you guys just love being around people that speak with kindness and gentleness? Has anybody ever heard anybody say, I really can't stand that guy? You know, he always speaks with such kindness. <laughs> or how about, oh man, 
I, that, I, can't, I just can't be around her anymore. She speaks with way too much gentleness. No, because we love people who speak with kindness and gentleness. And I know, you know, one of the things when Amy and I came here to Shoreline in 2012, we saw that evidenced throughout the congregation. And I still think that transcends and just that fills this church. And that's why we love Shoreline. People speak with kindness and gentleness. And heavenly wisdom also yields words that are submissive. I mean, these are words that reflect respect. And these are words that unless we're told to do something immoral, illegal, or goes against God's word, then we have to obey those who are placed in positions over authority regardless of whether or not we agree with the decision that's been made. Why do we do that? Because God put them in authority over us. And so one of the ways we can do that is, let's say our boss makes a decision. And even though we recommend it against that decision, the boss has the authority to make the final decision. They make the decision, and our response needs to be words that are submissive. Words like, okay, how can I support? Words that are submissive. And also, heavenly wisdom yields words that are full of mercy and good fruit. And I think of full of mercy, that's giving undeserved kindness and forgiveness to those who don't deserve it. I mean, these are words that breathe grace. When you think about what God has done for us, God's grace, God's forgiveness of what we've done, how can we not want to breathe in his grace and breathe out his grace? Words like, I forgive you. Powerful words. Powerful word. They extend, they're full of mercy. And words that are full of fruit. And I think about, what, what is this good fruit? It's good fruit to me. Is it's sweet to the taste, and it's healthy for you. And you think about words that might fit that description. I mean, these are words that affirm or strengthen those bonds of a relationship that we might have. Words like, I love you. Words that you would share with your spouse, your children, your family members, your your friends, your deepest friends. How about words like, I appreciate you. Words that you say, you share with your coworkers, your teammates. Maybe it's even those who work for you. I appreciate you. The power those words can have. And how about, I trust you. Powerful words that affirm and strengthen those bonds of relationships that we have. And also words that edify. These are words that build up and words that encourage and bolster. And these are words that we use to encourage others. And we think about words that might be like, like, I know you can do this. I believe in you. I'm proud of you. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a a neighborhood picnic. And there was a a lady there, and she was having a conversation with a young guy. and, And she actually, her and her husband actually are shoreliners. And so I was listening to the conversation and, and this young guy, he's kind of gone through a pretty rough time in his life. And he's just now making the turn, and he's, he's come out on the other end, and he's really through no fault of his own. And she listened to him talk. And when he finished talking, she looked at him, and she said, I am so proud of you. And she said, I am so happy for you. And here's this young guy, this tough exterior, and I look in his eyes, man. He's just got, like, tears rolling up in the corner. I mean, those words, good fruit, encouraged him, affirmed him. And heavenly wisdom also yields words that are impartial. And these are words that express unbiased dignity and fairness to all people. And I think of someone at Shoreline that exemplifies that. I think of Dave Leas. And how many of you know Dave Leas? Well, if you don't know him, you're probably going to soon. Uh, Dave is the guy every Sunday... He's out here before 7 o'clock in the morning, and he's out there setting up the tents in our courtyard. And Dave doesn't just leave after he sets them up. He stays for all our services, and he's out there greeting people as they're coming and going. And it doesn't matter what you look like, where you came from, or how long you've been going to Shoreline. Dave is one of those guys. He's an equal opportunity hugger. He's an equal opportunity listener, and he's an equal opportunity speaker of wise words. See, Dave, he speaks with heavenly wisdom, words that are impartial. And heavenly wisdom yields words that are sincere. And these are words that are truthful and honest. They're real and authentic. You know, and these are the words when people speak, they have the courage to speak the truth. 
but they also do it, the compassion to speak with grace. And aren't you guys happy for those people in your life? I'm happy for those people in my life that took the time to do that, to speak words that are sincere. And so I want you to imagine for a moment with me. Just imagine how our lives could be different, how our relationships could be different, how our marriages could be different, how our families could be different, and even how our workplace or maybe even our schools could be different if when we speak, we speak with wise words, words that are pure and peace-loving, words that are considerate and submissive, words that are full of mercy and good fruit, and words that are impartial and sincere, wise words that reflect the wisdom of heaven. And so here's our faith in action challenge. Before I speak, I will search my heart and seek the wisdom of heaven. And when I speak, I will speak with wise words. Search, seek, speak. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice and for your love and for your grace and for your truth. And Lord, we thank you that, that you have transformed us as we put our faith in you. And so, Lord, now we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would, you would transform us, you would transform our tongue, that we would be people that would speak with wise words. And Lord, we thank you as we go from this place, Lord, we just want to commit, we want to commit that we will, in fact, we will search our hearts and we will seek your wisdom and we will speak wise words. And we pray this all, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean.